So again, welcome. My name is Diana Vera Alba. I will be going over our webinar this morning entitled Tips and Tools for Teaching Online. Um, and I want hopefully for you to go away uh, with this with um, some tools um, and as well as a way to enjoy teaching online. Um, I'm currently an instructor at San Diego Community College District as well as I'm an OTAN subject matter expert. Um, and a little bit about myself, I've been an online instructor, teacher, and trainer since 2012. As an educator, I've been a distance education uh, educator, uh, hybrid instructor, and a fully online instructor, or a combination of all, all three of these at the same time. As a student, I have taken many online courses. I've gotten online certifications. Um, I got my um, multiple subject teaching credential um, cleared online, and I did a whole master's program online. So um, put an asterisk there because I think it's really important. Um, if you've ever taken any type of online class, even a, a webinar like this, you know, think about what you liked and what you didn't like, because that's what, that's how I created my online courses. So for today, our agenda, um, I have some resources to help you transition. We're going to start off with a video called Eight Lessons Learned from Teaching Online. Um, we're gonna talk about differences of remote teaching, what that means and what it looks like. Um, what does it take to be a great online instructor? What tech skills are needed to be a great online instructor? And where can I find additional help for these um, maybe newfound um, tips or, or um, you know, where can I get this help? Okay. So we'll start off with a video. touch is more important than high tech. When a student is in crisis or a student wants to brainstorm an idea and when they need a question answered, I want to be efficient. And one of the best ways of doing that is using the telephone. And so that's a real high touch way that has been really effective for me. And I had really avoided it for a long time because I thought, no, that's really not the technology of online education. But everything is the technology of online education. Establish social presence using digital storytelling. When you start in a face-to-face -face classroom, when that professor comes in, you're looking at their clothes, the way they act, the jokes, the stories, all these things. You size up who they are, right? So for me, one of the things I leveraged or I, I relied on was the power of storytelling. And so the power of storytelling, you know, telling stories is a great way to establish your presence and to help students get to know each other as real people. Use technology intentionally. I think we get so excited, I know I do, about new tools and, and new digital communities and social media tools and technologies that we can use to really enhance what we're trying to achieve with students in our courses. Uh, but we sometimes let the tool sort of drive our decision making as opposed to going back to our learning objectives and saying, what do we really want to achieve? Does the tool help us achieve that? Just because we get really excited. The power of external resources. There's tons of resources out there that if you just take the time to look, it's amazing what you can use to supplement your online courses. And so you don't have to do all the work yourself. It doesn't always have to be contained in the LMS or in the tech. And hopefully through that also help encourage and teach your students that there's great resources out there if you just spend the time. Make your expectations explicit. Being explicit in your directions, in your expectations, um, in everything that you are trying to achieve with students. That so often we keep that secret, we keep that hidden as faculty. Uh, we know what it is. Sometimes we don't even know that we're keeping it hidden. Make it really easy for students to find out what is it they have to do that week, when does it do, how, what are the points, what's at work, those types of things fun and playfulness and the unexpected. Doing something that's different 
um, can really jolt them and re-energize them and re-engage them in a way that allows them to express themselves creatively. So that it's not just writing an essay, but let's write a screenplay that demonstrates your understanding of these concepts. So anything that adds a little playfulness, I think just re-engages people and makes the online experience not feel so cookie cutter. You have to log in regularly. You probably should plan at least five days a week to be logging in your course. Now that doesn't mean you have to log in, you know, all day, five days a week, right? Sometimes people, I think, misconstrue that and, and will say things like, well, online learning is just so much more work than face-to-face. -face. I don't necessarily buy that, but it's very distributed. The faculty that I know that are the most successful in my own experience has been, they log in regularly to their courses. The power of personal feedback. One of the things that I find that students really value and that they take away from is when they get specific individual feedback that's meaningful. And by not just giving feedback, but giving audio video feedback, I've had students come back to me and really comment on how it was very meaningful to hear that even the inflection in my voice and, and that they could actually walk away with the positive comments. Whereas a lot of times when you just type stuff out, they just, they, the negative just kind of comes through, right? Okay, thank you for focusing on that video. That really does give us an introduction to what it is like to teach online. Um, so what are some differences that you know or you think might in be included in remote teaching? So I want you to think about those um, as we go through um, this next section of the webinar. Think about what some of those differences are in remote teaching. Okay, so remote teaching um, can be different than online teaching. So online teaching, just like classroom teaching, is built on pedagogical models. And that's not necessarily what remote teaching is, but it can be. So remote teaching can be delivered through online, on an LMS such as Canvas, Google Classroom, Blackboard, Google Sites, School, Schoolology, or just a website. Um, remote teaching can also be by email. It can be with apps that you assign students or you ask students to use, or it can be on a cell phone. So what does it take to be a great online instructor? Well, first off, it's not going to happen instantly, right? Just like, think about it when you first started teaching. You were excited to be in the classroom. You had possibly just come out of your um, teacher education program. And then all of a sudden, you have this classroom full of students. I mean, were you awesome and great on the first day? That is great if you were, but oftentimes it's over time, it's over practice, it's over experience that you do become a great instructor. It's the same thing online. So some of those best practices that um, online teachers like to focus towards or teachers in general, um, well, first off, it was mentioned in the video to be present, okay? And that means logging in. Again, it doesn't mean that you're going to be online 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but you should log in to your course. Um, I'll give you an example. I, like I mentioned earlier, I was an online student before I became an online instructor, and that was by choice. I wanted to take um, some courses online. It was convenient, which is a, a very good reason that many of our students um, in a regular online class would take a class. But I had an instructor who had this great syllabus, um, was obviously very organized because she basically dumped her whole curriculum, that whole semester, week by week in the LMS. At that time we were using Blackboard and just left it to us. So it was almost like those old um, transcription mail courses, you know, where you get this work by mail and then you complete it and you turn it back in and no contact with the instructor whatsoever. 
well, that's how this class was. And it was probably the worst experience I've ever had because if any of the students questions, um, the instructor was just not online ever. Um, so the students started a little blog amongst ourselves where we were kind of helping each other out. First of all, it was, where's the instructor? Oh my gosh, um, where do we ask her questions? And then we just kind of started helping each other on this blog because this instructor was not present at all other than, you know, um, the curriculum that she left there. So be present. I mean, that was an extreme case, but be present. That's definitely um, important. Um, the second one, set expectations. Um, in the video, it was mentioned to set explicit expectations, and that's great. If you want to tell your students, um, you know, I won't be available after 7 p.m. or I won't be available between one and two. You know, those are clear, explicit expectations. So make sure you set those expectations with your class. Um, nurture a supportive online community. And that's also really important. You know, um, in the video it was mentioned to give personal feedback. Um, there are some great tools out there that let you give audio and video feedback. If you um, have an LMS like Canvas, Canvas has it embedded in the grading feature. But if you don't, there are great free tools out there where you can, um, you know, give students that feedback and, and nurture that supportive online community. And then think before you write or send in this case, right? Before you post an announcement, before you send out an email, read it and reread it. Because as you know, sometimes when we receive emails or even text messages, the feeling that you had is not, does not transpire and somebody might either get offended or really not understand the message you were trying to say. So um, think before you, you send or post, okay? And then ask your students for feedback. It's kind of like in the classroom where we ask for, or where we have students um, complete an exit ticket as they're leaving. You know, especially initially, ask your students for feedback. What did you think about that assignment? Um, you know, I meet with my students um, once a week in my online reading class every Monday night, and we, the first 15 minutes, we're discussing how the assignment was from the previous week, what they liked, what they didn't like, and that helps me support them in their learning, okay? And then let students do the work. And by this, I mean, let them have student-led discussions. That's one example. Um, you can also, um, just like in this presentation, you can also have students share their um, PowerPoints with the class and let them lead a portion of that weekly class. And then, then, then you're creating community within your students and within your class. Okay, so um, some of the things that I believe that are really important to be a great online um, instructor is patience and patience with yourself as well. Patience with your students and patience with yourself. And, you know, if you're honest about that, if you're honest about, hey guys, look, this is my first online class. I know I did that before. And then all of a sudden the tension, you know, was alleviated because it might have been my students' first online class. So, um, you know, being patient with each other um, is really important. Communication, as I mentioned already, is super, super important. Um, there are many great communication tools. I personally use an app called Remind. You might have heard of that before. Um, you know, if you use an LMS, some of the LMS have email feature on there. But I personally, um, I like Remind because it's an instant message to my cell phone. Um, I can quickly respond to a student if I'm not at my computer. I, I can give them a timeline. Hey, I'm not on my computer right now, but I'll get back to you within the next two hours or within 24 hours. You know, again, setting that expectation as part of that communication. Okay. And then continuous education on our part, on your part, right? Um, you know, when I first started off as an online instructor, there weren't as many tools and and I probably don't use 
most of the tools that were available to me when I first started, you know, and, and once you get into online teaching, I think you're really going to love it. And so I really loved it. And I continuously um, try to go to conferences or even jump on a webinar if I see it to see what the latest and greatest is. So continuous education is so important just in our field altogether. Organization is important, organization of your um, materials, however you decide to post those materials, whether it's on an LMS or an email or whatever it is that you decide to use. Organization, just like in the classroom, face-to-face um, -face classroom is really important. And then be creative. Um, creativity, like was, was mentioned in the video, you know, to have a fun, playful um, assignment helps re-engage students and and that's so important in online teaching okay so we're going to take a look at each of these five a little bit further so communication with your students so what does that look like okay so communication should be continuous um, as was mentioned um, you know it's not you're on the computer 24 hours a day but you should be on the computer at least checking in checking to see if students are completing the assignment maybe maybe you forgot to post a par portion of the assignment and students are saying hey teacher you forgot this part right so um, continuous communication with your student is very important and then think about short uh, communication and long communication so by this I mean a quick email um, an announcement or even a webinar like this with um, products such as zoom or Google sites or something like that um, setting expectations um, you know and you can do this in your syllabus just like you would in your classroom right if you have if you decide to designate office hours or if you decide to say uh, post something within 24 hours or a, um, a response within 24 hours that way students know what to expect they're not sitting there and waiting and then use apps for communication again i use remind i love it it's a phone app it's a messaging um, app um, but you can use skype or dropbox or zoom um, so there's lots of different apps out there and use what's ever comfortable for you right um, and not that's not to say that next semester or the next class you're going to use a different app but you know, pick an app or, uh, you know, one or two pieces of uh, communication that you're going to use regularly with your students. And that way you're setting that expectation once again. And then again, continuous education on your part. Never stop learning, right? I mean, we heard that when we, in our teacher education courses that you're getting into a program or you're getting into a career where you're constantly going to be educating yourself and that's the fun part that's what keeps us that's what keeps me going at least um, so do take advantage of any training OTAN has great trainings your district probably has some training and even YouTube tutorials there are great YouTube tutorials and there are some instructors that I like following them online. And they, they're quick, easy, they show you the latest and greatest, or just maybe one tip for online teaching or some new tool that they're using that they're excited about. And again, don't expect to be an expert. I mean, I have doing, been doing this for a while and I certainly don't feel like an expert yet, um, but I feel um, that with the continuous learning and continuous education, I've become, a, you know, somewhat of an expert, at least in my district, and then practice and try it. Okay, so there may be some tools out there that you saw maybe at a presentation and you were like, wow, that was great, but oh, I don't know, it sounds really complex. I don't know if I can do it. Just try it, okay? And if you fail, get up and try again. We've all done this, right? Um, I think we've all failed at some point or another or another or another, and we just keep trying, right? So don't give up on yourself, just keep moving. Diana, I'm gonna interrupt just for a sec because um, you, you uh, mentioned something and someone has a question. I don't wanna uh, miss it. Sure. Who who do you follow online? Who are the, those teachers that you follow that you think their videos are good? Because folks, not all videos are created equal. Right. I have many. And at the end, if you'd like, um, 
I could share some, but um, yes, I do have several. And sometimes it's just a, a, if I have a question, for example, I saw somebody using Loom for feedback and I thought, wow, that sounds really cool, but I still didn't quite understand how to use it. So I just use, I use YouTube the way I use Google. And I just kind of, in the search box in Zoom, right, how to use Loom to give student feedback. And then poof, all these, um, all these videos pop up, just like if you Google something on Google, all these things come up. And then I just, I typically like to go to the shorter videos. I don't want to watch a 30 minute video. I, you know, that's just me, but I'll, I'll, I'll look for some quick and easy <laughs> videos and, and maybe I'll watch five or six of them. And then if I, I, if I see an instructor that I really like, then I just click on subscribe because I'll, I'll, before I click subscribe, I look at their other videos. And instructors that are on YouTube usually have a YouTube channel. Like I have a YouTube channel, but it's kind of by accident because they create screencasts for my students. But I do have a small, you know, um, YouTube channel. And um, so many of us on 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 YouTube will have this. And then you can look at the rest of their videos. And that's how I gauge whether ooh, I want to keep watching this, this person. And if you subscribe, if you click on that little subscribe button on YouTube, there's also a little bell and you'll get a reminder every time this instructor posts a new video. So um, that's how I, I do it. Um, and then I created a library. So if there's a video that I really like and I, I save it to my library and then I call it something like, um, how to blah, 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 whatever that is, you know, just like you would a music library on YouTube, you could create a music library. I create a, a video library on, on YouTube. All right, but I, I can share my, I, my library at the end if you'd like. Um, okay, so going to, yep, I don't going to organization. So organization is really important, just like in your face-to-face -face class. Organization, um, for example, using an agenda like I did at the beginning of this webinar. And the agenda, um, you know, just kind of walks you through what I'm going to go over. I do the same thing with my students. Like I said, I, I meet with them once a week on Mondays. And I start with a PowerPoint or Google slide presentation. I post it before um, the, the time that we meet so that students know what we're going to um, discuss ahead of time. That way they can come in with questions based on the agenda. Um, and then keep it simple. Um, your organization should be easy to follow. Um, I organize, I use Canvas with my district. So I organize my, um, my class by week, weekly segments, but you, some instructors organize by unit, um, the units that they're working on, for example, in a book or something like that. Um, and then use numbers for reference. So this picture on the right hand side is a clip of my organization. So if you look at the top, it says 7M Zoom. So 7M means week seven. So this was a week seven um, Zoom meeting at, at the very top. And then I use it the way you would use um, uh, an agenda. So right under the seven is 7.1. That's the main topic, you could say, um, the reading strategy we went over. And then I indent, and then everything below that is an activity or something they have to do, a to-do, uh, re uh, referring back to that main uh, idea of that reading strategy. So some of them are things they have to read, some of them are videos that they have to watch, some of them are quizzes they have to take. Um, so the numbering system really helps because if, if, if I forgot something or if a student has a question about something, instead of them just sending me a message saying, I didn't understand this week's assignment. Well, there's like three or four or five different assignments. But if they say, I didn't quite understand the chart on 7.1.2, can you please, you know, give me more information? Or classic Diana, I forget to um, 
I forget, I, I post the, <laughs> the item and I think it looks great and then I forget to publish it for the students. So they'll send me right away, you didn't publish the quiz, please publish the quiz. So these are little things and then they'll, they'll give me the number and just, instead of just saying that quiz, I, I didn't understand it or I can't open it, um, they'll tell me exactly the number. So that's how I use it, kind of like an outline, um, the way you would, um, use the numbers, but use whatever makes sense for you and makes sense for your students. Again, creativity, um, have fun and make your assignments fun and exciting, include videos. I love using TED Talks, um, you know, having students watch a TED Talk video and then have a discussion about it right after and maybe a quiz or vocabulary. You can pull, you know, I teach ESL, so prior to them watching the TED Talk video, I'll post a Quizlet with um, vocabulary um, or you can use quizzes or any other type of vocabulary um, tool prior to them watching the TED talk and then after the TED talk or YouTube video or screencast I'll have you know a low stakes quiz and you know I don't mean like a you know nothing beyond five questions just a quick low stakes four or five question um, quiz just so that I I can see if they really understood the gist of the message in the video or um, the assignment that I gave them. And then there are lots of apps available. Um, you can use Zoom, you can use Kahoot. And I just went to this Kahoot, just the other day I went on a Kahoot webinar because I, I was like, wow, Kahoot online, how do you use that? And it was so easy. You use it with Zoom, Skype, or Hangouts, just like you would in class. So then I was like, oh, duh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and it was just a really quick, short Kahoot. Uh, webinar. So if you missed it, you can find it, find it for sure on YouTube um, or see how other teachers use Kahoot online. Um, USA Learns is great. That already has videos and quizzes um, for students, uh, ESL students. And then ReadWorks is another great one that I use. Um, it's online articles for students and the this program readworks has quizzes that students can use so um you know this in the video is mentioned that you can use these apps outside of your lms so outside for me outside of canvas i could create a classroom in readworks and i could create a classroom in um, quizlet and it's okay for students to use these programs outside of your Okay, so what, what tech skills are needed as far as for myself as an instructor and for my students? Um, so when you think about your skills, hone in on your existing skills and embrace your new skills. So what are you good at in the classroom and how can you transfer that into an online environment? So think about that. Um, so maybe you're a good communicator and, and you can hone in on those skills and um, have this great um, environment where you're communicating constantly with your students and they're able to communicate with each other. Um, technology li literacy is really important. So if you're, if you're not real confident in that area, start taking webinars and quick trainings. And like I said, YouTube is full of really quick, short trainings on many different types of tools and many different types of things. So um, start looking for those. Um, time management is really important. I know when I get really into whatever it is that I'm doing, whether it's an online tool, I tend to spend a lot of time in it and, and really dive in. Um, but, you know, keep track of your time and, and um, that'll kind of help you not get really worn out um, and then always assess and evaluate your students like they mentioned in the video um, personal feedback is really important and meaningful personal uh, feedback there are some great programs like i mentioned i saw um, a teacher talk about loom and how she uses this video um, tool to give feedback to our students and I was really interested in that so I went on YouTube and, and started looking for how to use that tool 
and then teaching students to apply new concepts with the tools they have. So many of our students have computers or tablets or even cell phones. And um, some of my students have computers, tablets, and cell phones, and they prefer to use their cell phones because they can easily download that app that I'm teaching them. They can, you know, my students use Canvas. They can download Canvas to their cell phones. And I mean, me personally, I want this big, giant, 17-inch screen, but, you know, students don't mind using the screen on their cell phones. So, um, you know, work with them. See what, what, which apps, that's what I always try to do. Um, if I'm introducing a new application, what does this work on? Will it work on cell phone? Will it work on tablet? Or is it only for computers? And I let students know that. So um, I try to um, be as communicative as possible on, on what features are going to work on their cell phones and what tools are going to work on their cell phones and which tools are best for their, for their computer. But I, I do that research when I'm, I'm, when I'm on that website or that web tool. And where can I find additional help? Well, I already mentioned YouTube online, right? But OTEN, o OTEN has some great weekly webinars. Or you can request a subject matter expert for your staff. You can request a webinar for your staff. Um, there are many great online resources. So this is a live link. I'm going to go over those in just a moment. Um, your district. You can get help. Many times your district offers um, some kind of tech training, YouTube tutorials, which I love, and or you could just Google it, right? Um, and when you Google at the very top, you can click on videos if you want to watch a video, or you can just read about it. Um, so let me go over to this online resource really quick. All right, so here we are at the OTAN website, and you have some buttons here at the top. So the second button over is training. So this is where I was mentioning the face-to-face -face or online workshops. But this button here that says resources, there are lots and lots and lots of resources, and one in particular is called Teaching with Technology. Um, so if you click here, um, and scroll down a little bit, you will have some subcategories here. So you have adult basic education, high school equivalency, high school diploma, and ESL. So I'm going to click on ESL. And then to the left, you have the title of the resource and what technology um, this resource technology you need for this resource or what's included in this resource. And you can scroll down and there are many, 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 many resources. You could see here at the top, there's 353 resources. But if you want to filter them, we do have a filter here off to the right. You can filter by level, you can filter by subject, you can filter by standard, and then click submit. So if I want intermediate high and I want some writing activities and let's say um, we're on the topic of employment and I click submit, then now this narrows it down to 266 results. So you can keep um, filtering to or just start looking through these um, resources. You see that they're highlighted in blue. So if you click on one of these resources, it's going to take you to a separate site where um, it'll show you the website, it'll give you a description, how to prepare, how to use it, what levels, the standards. Some of the um, different resources have um, longer description or more information. So you just want to take a look at these and, and, and start browsing and see what you like. Okay. And Diana, we have a question while you're getting there. Um, can we take these activities and or worksheets and put them on our Canvas pages? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, you can download anything that's there to be downloaded and um, or you can link to them. So uh, either way. Always, always, always practice self-care, okay? So we do these, this as teachers, right? We put so much into our students and our lessons and our time, but practice self-care. 
So just remember that remote teaching is different or online teaching is different and that's absolutely okay. Um, be kind to yourself and be kind to your students. You're both learning together. And if you communicate with that with your students, I think there will be a bond there that you possibly maybe didn't have before, but this learning together um, environment is, and, and communicating that with your student, is, I think is really important. Um, you will not recreate your face-to-face -face class, and that's absolutely okay. Online or remote learning is not face-to-face, -face, and you shouldn't try to put that much pressure on yourself that you're going to recreate that. But it can evolve into something wonderful, um, definitely something different and a different, a different experience for you and your students. And expect to make mistakes. And that's absolutely okay. Just like the mistakes that we all make in our classrooms, it's absolutely okay. And enjoy what you're doing. I really, really, really love this uh, platform because there's a creativity that I have online that I, that I don't necessarily have, have in a face-to-face -face environment. So I really, really enjoy that aspect of it. Plus I'm kind of techie, so I, I really, really get excited when I have a new tool um, to share with my class. So for any questions uh, or further training requests, you can contact OTAN um, at support at OTAN.us, okay? okay? And Diana, we have a question. I didn't want to miss it. Um, Regarding students limited in tech and ESL, I've had a good experience with U.S. Learns for lower levels, also to connect to students in these times. What would you think of Facebook? 100% of my current students use it in one class for chats or to help them with each other. So what are your thoughts on the Facebook being used? So I have used Facebook in the past, not my personal Facebook. I create a, a, a private Facebook account um, for my students. and. Um, this is a good communication tool, great communication tool. It's a great way to post um, post things. I used to post like um, job fairs that were coming up um, and things like that. The nice thing about it is if you create it, if you're the creator of this page, you can have control over allowing students to post things. And I would definitely do that. Um, if you do want to allow students to post, I would um, filter it so that you get to see the item and approve it before they post it. But yes, definitely, if you don't have an LMS, Facebook can be a great place for you to post assignments and, and use it in that format. Okay, what would you use to schedule weekly student appointments? for Google Meet. I want students to be able to see what time slots have already been signed up for and what's still available. So I use a um, Google Sheet um, and you can use a Google Sheet or you can use, because that's um, and students can, as students add to the time slots, um, you can see it live. Um, so yeah, I would definitely use a, a Google document, whether it's a Google Doc or a Google Sheets. And uh, what do you think of Duolingo? I love Duolingo. And um, I, always, I always tell students about it. Um, it is, um, I would say it's kind of like a beginning to maybe intermediate. I now teach advanced, but even my advanced students like the vocabulary in it and just that um, kind of fun interactive game, the gaming part of it. Um, but yeah, Duolingo is, is definitely a great um, tool that they can use very easily on their cell phone. In fact, it's, I think it's best used on your cell phone. <laughs> Diana, do you know where the OTAN resources uh, guide is on the OTAN website? And if you don't, I'm going to hand you over to uh, Anthony Burek. And Anthony, I'm going to go off mic as soon as the OTAN website comes up and uh, you can walk um, Diana through that. So everyone, Anthony Burek is uh, one of our other project specialists here at OTAN and here we go. So, um, yeah, I just want to take a couple of minutes um, with Diana's assistance here just to, because uh, I've noticed in the chat 
that um, people are asking about a lot of tools. Uh -huh. um, and Melinda will also, um, in a few minutes, tell us about some upcoming webinars that we have um, scheduled to that will that will cover some of the tools in question. But um, let's just take a look at what we have on our website so far. So um, the if you go to the OTAN website, OTAN.us, um, actually our uh, news story news story, which is listed there, um, and we're going to do something similar for next week. Um, this will give you a list of what we have upcoming in terms of webinars, and I also had, um, I typed a note in the chat about our uh, open office hours. I think Melinda is also going to talk about that in a second. But just in terms of the scheduling of things coming up with OTAN, um, this would be a good place for all of you to just check in maybe, um, you know, every day or every couple of days just to see what we have coming up so that you can go ahead, if there's something that, that's of interest to you, you can go ahead and register directly from uh, by clicking on the links to the sessions. So um, this would be kind of the first place to start. Then in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see our COVID-19 field support button. So at OTAN, we're trying to centralize a number of resources um, that we feel will be um, relevant for all of you in the field to um, stay, uh, you know, to keep, keep knowledgeable on what's coming and what's going on and things like that. So Melinda asked me specifically about the resource guide that we've developed. So at the very top, Diana, under the OTAN heading, so it says COVID-19 field support, and then mm -hmm. the first heading is OTAN, and then the first item there is the OTAN resource guide. So if you go ahead and click on that guide, okay. So we actually, this was, um, this came out of a news item that we created, and this just gives you a little bit of a sense of how the guide is organized. We really felt it was important um, not only to just give you a list of, of items, which can be overwhelming, and I get that sense from the chat that some of you are just like totally overwhelmed by the number of things that Diana mentioned. But um, so we've, we've created a list, but we've also tried to add some support materials so that, you know, whether it's a video or maybe an article to read, so that you at least have a sense of what the tool is and how you might get started with it. So Diana, if you go ahead and click on that link, that's right in the paragraph there, thank you. So um, this is basically, for the moment, this is kind of the place where we are trying to list all of the teaching items, um, well, not all of them, but a variety of teaching items that are out there that are, you know, that you might consider using. Um, and then, for example, like some of you were asking about videos, uh, some of you were asking about LMSs, some of you were asking about, um, you know, how do I get started with online teaching, things like that. So let's, um, let me, let's scroll down a little bit to oh, people. Oh, yeah, let's scroll down maybe to page two because some people, for example, were asking about like Google Cloud, right? And did I list? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. it's there. Okay, so on the guide, um, like I say, you know, we, we're trying to come up with like a list of what we feel would be, you know, some of the tools that some of you would use for this, you know, online learning, remote learning, distance learning period. So again, we, we list the item first on the left-hand column. And then in the right-hand column, again, we're trying to give you some, um, play, you know, some, tool, some materials that you can use to get started. It doesn't matter, you don't, these are just um, videos that are either on the, our YouTube channel or their articles or other items that are on the OTAN website. So you don't need like any kind of a Gmail account or anything like that to look at these videos, read the materials, anything like that. So um, we would suggest that maybe for some of the questions you've asked, you know, take a look at our resource guide first, see if there are specific videos or, or articles that you could read to help you get started. And then if you have more specific questions, you know, please email us or Melinda, um, again, is going to come up with, or, or, sorry, is going to, um, give us a list of some of the upcoming webinars that we have. So, um, you know, there are a couple of different ways that we're trying to support you all. Um, this resource guide is a 24 seven guide. It's gonna be updated um, as we get more materials. Um, and then you'll also wanna look at the OTAN website 
um, in order to get a sense of what we have upcoming, you know, over the next week or so. Um, so I made reference to some Zoom trainings. Uh, Zoom does its own trainings and we have watched the video so that we understand how to use it. So, and yes, Diana's going to share names. Um, go to the, the Zoom link is up here somewhere in the chat. Uh, use that or go to zoom.us and click on training and, and there's a bunch of videos on how to get started, how to start a meeting, how to invite people. Like I said, we don't have to create that training because it's already created for you and it's really a good training. Um, Diana, you were going to share a list of your YouTube go-tos. Um, so one of the um, videos that I just discovered, and this was from TDLS, I was watching Stephanie Thomas's um, presentation, but PowerPoint School is awesome. And this guy is really, really fast, but he creates these great um, animated PowerPoints. So that's a great one. Um, here's the how to host a Kahoot live. Look, this video is like one minute, 30 seconds. That's how easy it is to create this um, Kahoot live. And many of us are familiar with using Kahoot in our classroom. And I can believe how easy it was to do this live online. So that was, um, you know, that's just from Kahoot. You can subscribe to Kahoot on um, YouTube. Um, here's another one, Zoom for students in under five minutes. Oh my gosh, that was super easy as well. Um, let's see. Here's one of mine. <laughs> um, I create screencasts for my students because like I mentioned, I use Canvas. So in this one minute, 58 second video, I showed students how to embed an image into their Canvas discussion. Um, let's see. EdTech um, is also great. Here's one for EdTech. Um, like Melinda mentioned, Zoom has their own YouTube channel. So here's another one for Zoom. There's music in here too. Oh, here's ESL writing um, videos. Um, so those are really, really great as well. Um, so, I mean, just start using Zoom the way you would Google. And, you know, if I Googled, how to use Zoom with students. Oh, there was one on Facebook with Facebook Live. Look at that. Somebody asked about Facebook earlier. And here are videos on how to do that with Facebook. So um, that's how I use um, YouTube is I use it the way I would use Google to Google something or to find an answer for something. And then you get all these videos, um, you know, Zoom webinars at Facebook and YouTube live streaming. I mean, and you'll start noticing the instructors that pop up, you know, quite a bit. And then um, you can also go on their channel and just click on their name like this person here or this person has the WP Elevation, that's their Zoo, um, YouTube channel. And then if you click on it, it'll, um, it'll give you all of this person, all of their um, videos if they have a um, YouTube channel. Now, um, a lot of you wanted to know how to use Zoom. OTAN uses Zoom, Zoom's training center. Okay, so right here, getting started. Uh, you get started with Windows or a Mac, right? You're starting the Zoom desktop client. How to do all of those things that we're doing right now. It's a step-by-step -step and they give videos for some of them. It's really a good series and there was no point in us having a Zoom training. Uh, we just sent our trainers here as well, said, hey, watch this <laughs> and you'll learn how to do it. So um, use this if you want to know how to use Zoom.